So this next story here makes me really, really sad. And I have to say that my face during this story looked a little something like this. That's what my face was as I listened to this story. Um, so Tulsi went on NPR and she was asked about her support of Medicare for All. Now, there had been whispers previously of like, she's sort of backing off of it a little bit. And I, I hadn't seen evidence of that. So my, I thought like, okay, my guess about Tulsi is that she supports Medicare for All because she signed on to the Medicare for All bill, to her credit. Um, but it's not her top priority. It's not, and it's not even one of her top priorities. Obviously, first and foremost, she cares about foreign policy. Now, that's her prerogative, and that's totally fine. But I was still under the default assumption that, like, okay, she... But she believes in it, right? She believes in it. Well, these comments... Uh, kind of show otherwise. When you say healthcare, are you for Medicare for all? If you can just tick through the list more specifically. Uh, yes, I support, I prefer to call it Medicare choice, where we are ensuring quality healthcare for all people, regardless of, of how little they may have in their pocket or they, their bank account, while ma maintaining their freedom of choice. If they've got a, a, an employer-sponsored plan or a union-sponsored plan that they're happy with, they should have the opportunity to do so. But the bottom line being that in the wealthiest nation in the world, there is no excuse that we still have far too many Americans who are underinsured or uninsured and who are one healthcare emergency away from total financial disaster. Yeah. So she said she supports, quote, Medicare choice. And she goes on to say, if you like your employer-sponsored plan or your union-sponsored plan, you can keep it. So let me explain why this is not okay. The heart of Medicare for All is a provision about what's called duplicative insurance. And basically what that says is a private insurance company cannot offer insurance that Medicare for All, the single payer, already offers. Now, there are a variety of reasons for that, um, but probably the most important one is under a single payer system, you have a single payer, and so everybody pays into this single payer, the government, which is the only insurer, and you spread out the risk pool. And also, if you have a system like she's describing, you still have for-profit health insurance companies playing a major role in our health care system. And what will likely happen under this kind of system, which is a public option type system, is you have the for-profit health insurance companies basically try to take in only the healthy people, okay, so they can price gouge and still make tremendous profit. And they take all the sick people and they pawn only the sick people off to the government plan. And if you jack the government system full of only sick people, you don't have the risk spread around and the quality will tank. You'll have the quality of the public system tank because only the sick people go there and it's chronically underfunded. So then that's when, you know, conservatives get to turn around and say, see, we told you the private insurance is so much better. It's so much nicer. And the public system's a mess. Look at how terrible the public system is. So in order to do a real single-payer system, now I don't care if you want to say public funding of private institutions, private care, not insurance, private care, public funding of private uh, institutions or public funding of public institutions, that I don't care, I'll take either one. I'll take an NHS-style system or a French-style system. I don't care. But you need to have the no duplicative care provision in there. If you don't have the no duplicative care provision in there, it's not single payer. It's not Medicare for all. So this whole notion of like choice, I believe in choice when it comes to health insurance. Everybody needs to start thinking about that in this way. That's like saying I want choice for a fire department. No, the way that we all understand it works is like this. Oh, there's a fire. So now the fire department is going to come put it out. That's the end of the conversation. Would you, if a, if somebody knocked on your door and said, I'm selling uh, fire insurance and here, here's a list of what can get covered and they give you plans. Oh, if your living room catches fire, we're going to come put that out, but not if it's your kitchen. 
If your bedroom catches fire, we'll put that out. But your basement? No, that's not covered in this plan. If somebody did that, you'd be like, are you insane? Are you clinically insane? What are you doing? What are you talking about? The way this works is sick, help, end of conversation. Free at the point of service, too. Fire department doesn't show up and say, come on, pay me, what are you doing? So that's effectively what would happen under this system she's describing, is that you're allowing for-profit health insurance companies to sell you plans and say, oh, yeah, these things are covered, these things are not covered. You have the choice to pick here. This isn't like picking a bagel. We're talking about it being a human right. And this is not a single-payer Medicare for All system that she's describing. This is a public option-like system that she's describing. The idea, oh, if you like your health insurance plan, you can keep it. If you like it through your employer. The whole point of having employer-sponsored health insurance is that the employee can keep leverage over... The employer can keep leverage over their employees. And we just saw this happen with the GM strike. What happened? As soon as they went on strike, GM said, well, sorry, it looks like we're going to cut off your uh, insurance while you're striking. What? Some people were like, I have a kid with cancer. I need, I need that coverage. They're like, well, you shouldn't have protested. What? What? So this is the kind of system that would exist if what she's describing was implemented. Oh, if you like your employer-sponsored health insurance, I mean, under Medicare for All, everything is covered, and it's free at the point of service, full stop. Now, if she was just arguing for supplemental insurance, I'd have no problem with that, and I'd be defending her right now, because what is supplemental? Supplemental means those little tiny things around the edges that are sometimes experimental treatment that aren't covered. So, you know, whatever, if there's like homeopathy or something, which there's no evidence for, but some people swear by, if that's not going to be covered under Medicare for all, because it's there's no evidence for it, it makes no sense. But if you want to get some sort of plan that covers, you know, homeopathy, you want to get some sort of plan that covers cosmetic plastic surgeries, okay, can insurance companies exist to deal with that? I have no problem with that. But again, that's supplemental. That doesn't violate the duplicative care provision. What she's describing violates the duplicative care provision. And what would happen is, yet again, explain this as simply as possible, you have, um, the risk is not all in one pool. And private health insurance companies would try to keep only the healthy ones. They pawn off all the, the sickly ones or the ones who are likely to get sick to the government system. The government system is overburdened and not fully funded. The quality tanks. And then everybody turns around and goes, see, private care is obviously better. <sighs> that's really upsetting that she did this. It really is. And guys, I want you to stop and think about it. What we now know is that everybody other than Bernie has waffled on this. Everybody. Elizabeth Warren has waffled on it repeatedly. Tulsi's now waffled on it. And um, Andrew Yang has, he always throws an or in there. I support Medicare for all. Or, and then he goes on to describe a public option type system. There's only one candidate who's really going to make this a priority and fight for it. I wish that wasn't the case, guys. But that is the case. And I think everybody needs to acknowledge that. And, you know, listen, man, this segment, I like Tulsi. Everybody knows I like Tulsi. I really do. I think she's um, a necessary voice in the race. I like everything she has to say about ending regime change wars. There are some issues where she outflanked Bernie. Venezuela, for example. Edward Snowden. Julian Assange. So she's willing to be like a rogue and a maverick. So, in other words, I'm not saying that she has taken this position that she's taken because she's corrupt and because she's bought by the insurance companies. No. I think she's taken this position because she actually believes in this kind of position. But I just disagree with her. I don't agree with this Medicare choice stuff. I don't agree with the idea, oh, if you like your employer-sponsored plan, you can keep it. No. How about these people pay less and get more covered? How about that? How about we do a proper single-payer Medicare for All system, which is the only system that we know is going to work because all the evidence shows it, which is like the rest of the developed world, where we have a single-payer, and we spread the risk out properly in one pool. And then everybody's covered. 
And it's better quality care and it's cheaper. Really, really, really disappointing. Yeah, this I'm just upset by this.